I don't think I understand the question. Huh, I'm not familiar with this model. <laughs> ah, I am not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. That solves that problem. I mean, like, uh, no. Not to be a rabbit hole, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Let's see. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. My, my knowledge is limited. Okay, I've, I've, I think I've heard the name before, but yeah. Any other lingering questions from yesterday for EFA or anything about data screening? Or... Yeah, I, I wonder if you have a video on uh, uh, Cook's distance. I'll, I'll uh, on Cook's distance? Yeah, there's a video on Cook's distance. Uh, we'll show it today, tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll show it. But if you want, go to YouTube uh, and type Gaskin Cook's D and uh, Oh yeah, it's in this one, SEM Series 2016. But we'll do it again today as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. One, one operational question. Yeah. Could you, because you went kind of fast, could you just do the steps when you core, when you make the correlation table in Excel? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, real quick uh, follow up on making correlations in Excel. I'll just bring up uh, this stats practice data. I put this in the data folder. Let's see. So in correlation, let's go over here. So a bunch of data, just organized as you would normally organize it in SPSS. Uh, we can do this with our SPSS data as well. But two different ways, you can do equals corel uh, uh, with two columns, like this one and this one. And it'll give you the exact correlation. Sorry, I'm zoomed way out. Uh, let me zoom in here. Okay. So equals corel um, and give it a couple columns. And you can do that with two. Or if you want to do a full blown correlation matrix, uh, you need the data um, analysis tool pack, this thing. Yeah. Do you need to know how to get that? Is that what you're asking? Well, I know how to get that. You, you that. Know, okay, so once you have it, then click on it and use um, correlation here, correlation, and hit oh, hide, Whoop. there you go, hit okay. And um, then the input range is just all of your variables you're gonna correlate. And so, you also include the, uh, the labels? Yeah, okay. so I'll just, I'll just grab all of this here, control shift over and down, and then I'll say that I have labels in the first row give an output range just where I want to put it. Let's just put it up here, right there, and hit OK. And it'll uh, it'll produce this correlation matrix for you. Here it is. And now it's recorded in the video, if you ever wonder. It's on the video now. Uh, we are recording right now. So but when you do your write-ups for publication, they're not going to, they don't accept Excel statistics. Oh, it's just a correlation matrix. You can do it in any program you want. Yeah, as long as the formula is correct. I assume it will be. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's nice and easy. To, the one in SPSS is all muddled with a bunch of extra rows and columns. and Yeah, it's messy. This is great. Especially if you then go like this and go like this and go like this. There you go. That's nice. Yeah. And you can conditionally format it to just show you the big ones. Uh, give me the top 10 items Yep, in green. And OK. Oh, we should ignore those. Oh, well. Anyway, you see the big correlations there. OK, any other questions from yesterday? Yeah. So yesterday, you generated the factor scores. Mm -hmm. And you entered them into the data matrix. Yeah. Can we do? Uh, Correlations on the factor scores of the. Do does it make sense to do correlations on the factor scores? And the answer is yes. Let me open up that data set real quick. Um, you don't want too much correlation, I guess. Between. Uh, you don't want anything over like 0.82. Yeah. Well, but between the factor scores. Yeah. 
because that would imply that they're really the same thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Let's go to that data folder. Um, so everything from yesterday is saved. And I've saved one additional thing last night, which we'll use later today. It's the EFA pattern matrix. This is the final pattern matrix from our final EFA that we uh, conducted. But let me open up. Uh, whoop. Can you share that? It is on the Google Drive folder. That's where it is. It's in the data folder. Is that the one you did yesterday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the final EFA. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so let me open up this data set from yesterday. And this is the data set we'll be using today, the 2018 clean. It's going to take a moment, do a little dance. Just waiting. It is so slow, SPSS. We've got all day. We do have all day. <laughs> as long as we're, as long as we got all day. Did anyone do something awesome last night in Provo, aside from go to the Bombay house? Bombay You've never been to the Bombay house? You live in Provo. What's your problem? Oh, no. This is the actual name of the place. I didn't make this one up. Yeah. It's like the University. Yeah, it's good Indian food. Yeah. Again, free advertising. Pita Pit's good. Yeah. All right. So um, yesterday we produced these, uh, these variables down here, these factor scores, which, uh, oh. I ran another EFA. It produced factor scores again. Let me delete those. Ah, clear. So we produced these right here and we named them. Um, and so we can now use these in a correlation matrix if we want. Uh, we go to analyze, correlate, bivariate, and then go to the very bottom and we can get all those variables we produced uh, using factor scores, throw them in here into the correlation and hit OK. And this is the ugly correlation matrix it comes up with. But <clears throat> we'll see that it is the same if we were to correlate these over in Excel, you'd get the same values. Um, but they're valid. If we look in, I'm just going to copy this out. This is kind of just the wrong size here. Go to Excel, I don't know, Word. Yeah. Okay, and if I post, paste this in here, here we go. We can see correlations are significant, a lot of them, but none of them are like massive, which is what we're looking for. We want significant, non-massive. Massive would be anything over uh, 0.82. Don't ask me why, but that is the right number. Um, yeah, that looks pretty good. So. It works. You're working yeah, these are factor scores imputed from the EFA. Yeah. Yeah, the correlations will be the same. Yeah. Just different format in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was probably in a Monday Cool. I don't remember you doing that. Oh, we've never done this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, doing a correlation matrix uh, in SPSS. Do you want to see it again real quick? Well, yeah, you created those extra variables down there. Oh, do you, you don't remember doing that? I don't remember doing that. I was in the buffet one. Oh, okay. This is an important thing. Yeah, I totally Okay. Agree. We can go over that again real quick. Um, so you're good. You're good. Okay. So you go to do your factor analysis just like before. Uh, analyze dimension reduction factor and throw in all that stuff we had, um, which is all this. We don't need to do all the usual stuff. We know it's a good factor. Um, we know it's a good uh, factor analysis. So the only thing we need to do is make sure we have Promax on. And in the scores, this is the part you missed. In the scores, click on Save as Variable. And what that'll do is for every column in our pattern matrix, it'll produce a new variable. So we'll have eight new variables, and each one represents the factor that is loading most highly on that. And we do that with our final pattern matrix. If you want to. You don't have to, actually. This is just an option if you want to then do a correlation matrix with your variables or check your um, like multicollinearity or something like that for your regressions. You can do that. But it has to be with your final pattern matrix. Final pattern matrix. So not the... Eliminated all the ones you Exactly. Don't save fact. Don't save as variables throughout the whole time because you'll be saving 
variables every time you run the EFA. We ran it probably, what, 25 times yesterday? Um, so you end up with a lot of factors. It's not required. Yeah. So in the, during the EFA, you don't need to produce a correlation matrix. Um, it's important to look at it in the EFA. So like if I were to run this, let me uncheck this for a sec so I don't create more factor scores. Um, but in your EFA, zoom out. Ah. In your EFA, let me run this. Um, it's important to look at the correlation matrix at the bottom, just to make sure there aren't any strong, strong correlations above 0.7. Um, but it, during the CFA, will produce your, your final correlation matrix, yes. the one you'll actually report. Oh, well, you'll probably, uh, yeah, the plugin will produce it. Yes. Um, but you don't need to report this correlation matrix because we're just going to produce a final correlation matrix during the CFA. Yeah. So this is more of an FYI. Okay, anything else from yesterday? One more question on that. Yeah. If, let's say we do get that final pattern matrix and we decide to use the factor variable, will it, the next pattern matrix that it makes, will it have the factors on that one instead of the one through eight? Um, I don't think I understand. So you see how, well not the correlation matrix, you see how the, the when you, when you made that uh, correlation table, uh -huh. and it had yeah. the factors on top. Up here, yep. Yeah, like that. Yep. Will it do the same thing for the pattern matrix if you run it again? Of no, it's like not going to put those up there. No, nah. every time you do pattern matrix, the correlation matrix that comes out just uses numbers okay. as the labels. Yeah. Anything else before we do confirmatory factor analysis? Okay. So yesterday, I went through the slides for today. Um, I updated them a bit, but honestly, we're not gonna spend a lot of time in the slides, sort of like yesterday. Um, they're here, but we're just gonna be in Amos most of the day. Um, I'll, I'll cover a couple things real quick. <clears throat> CFA is confirmatory factor analysis. Um, has anyone here never used Amos before? Great, this will be a painful experience. Um, Amos, Amos has many pseudonyms, which I will not repeat in this classroom. Um, yeah. <laughs> he hates it with a passion. Um, you'll, you'll see in a moment. Amos is not user friendly, but it's more user friendly than any other user interface for statistics out there, uh, which is sad. Anyway, so we're going to do a confirmatory factor analysis in Amos today. Um, and it's good for doing a ton of stuff. In fact, the confirmatory factor analysis is the longest portion of your, of your analysis. Um, you do your data screening. It's pretty quick, right? Check normalities and outliers and stuff. Do your EFA. That could take you a few weeks. And then you do your CFA. And that's just where you get stuck in the rabbit holes. Um, and you're not sure if you're doing it right. And there's so many little, little things so we're going to cover all those little things today and hopefully set some solid uh, guidelines down. I added a few slides in here that give solid guidelines. I've also updated the stat wiki to include these guidelines. Um, and now we're going to have it in video form today. So we'll be good. What we're going to start with is opening Amos and cringing a little bit. So let's do that. Open up Amos if you have it. Amos graphics. Is anyone using a version earlier than 21, 22? Good. Oh, you are what version are you on? So, oh yeah, 25 is good. Yep, 25 is good. Oh, you don't need to have this showing when you start. Um, this is what we're gonna end up working with. What a mess. Yeah, it should intimidate you a little bit. Yikes. Okay, sorry, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to go down so quickly. Um, all right, so open up Amos. Let me make sure uh, everyone on this end is doing good. Yep, doing good remote side. Who will be following along in Amos? Just so I know how fast or slow to go. Most everybody, okay. 
You can try. Okay. You can do it. It'll be good. And you have new stuff to do with. Yeah. Well, if we have time at the end of the day, we should just do your model in, in Amos. That'd be cool. Oh, you Amos show up on my desktop? As an option. This oh, is what you put on my computer. Oh. Uh, type uh, search. Type Amos graphics. Amos space graphics. Oh, that was it. We missed it. Go back and just type Amos and we're good. Keep going. Oh, right here. Amos graphics. Where do you go? I just saw it. There it is. Right there. That one. Click on that. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Hopefully, it, it might not even. Hopefully, it's all right. We'll see. If it, if it gives you a license error. I had a 14 to 14 20 day, 14 20 day free trial. Yeah. 14 day free trial. Okay, so hopefully it works. Uh, it might be limited. I'm not sure how many variables or sample size it, it allows. Anyone else? We got Amos, Ryan, okay. 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 This is Amos. Um, it is, uh, you have your canvas here, you have all your tools over here on the left, and um, the tools are kind of fun, like a fire truck here, and a magic wand, and this set of balloons or something, and this candelabra, <clears throat> and I'll show you how it all works, but um, in Amos, we can use Amos for a couple things. Uh, one is testing a measurement model, like the CFA. The other is for testing a structural model, um, like testing your hypotheses. So in order to test your measurement model, your CFA, you have to build, and don't do this with me, just watch for a second, you have to build your model, um, control Z, which involves <clears throat> creating latent variables with indicators manually and rotating them. Don't do this with me, just watch. And then bringing your data into them and naming them. So like this would be uh, usefulness or something like that. And you'd have to bring in all your variables and all your error terms, which is stupid and it takes forever. So there's a plugin for that. There ain't nobody got time for that. Um, erase all, there we go. Um, we need to get plugins for several people. Do this. Go to StatWiki. Oh no, you don't need. Don't even need to do that. It's in the folder. Here they are. Go to uh, the SEM Bootcamp folder and go to Estimands and Plugins. And if you're in version 24 or 25, use the version 24 or higher folder. If you're in version 23 or lower, go to 23 or lower folder. Um, and we have a bunch of plugins in here. Uh, the one you need for right now is Pattern Matrix Builder, this thingy. You're going to just copy it, and then you're going to go find this super hidden location uh, to stick it in. So the hidden location is open up a new Explorer folder. Um, you can type Windows E to do that, or, or just go to your desktop or something like that. Fi find a folder. You need to see the, the folder tree is what you need. And you're going to go to this PC operating system C, OSC, or local disk C. And then users. And then your username. Mine happens to be Jay Gaskin. Don't ask who Apollo is. Jay Gaskin. And now we're in a folder that's not going to look the same for everybody. This is the hard part. Uh, you got to go up to the view spot, go to view, and check this box for hidden items. We want to see hidden items, so check that box. And once you do that, you'll be able to see all these other folders, including one called app data. Click on app data. And then local. And then your 
Un yeah, we got to unblock it in a sec. Yeah. Uh, local and then Amos development. And then Amos and then your version number for me, it's 25. And then plugins. Ha, ah, we made it. And then paste it in here. And once you've pasted it in here, go down to it and right click it. Go to its properties. And if it says unblock, check the box for unblock. I don't have an unblock here because my security rules are very lax. Um, but if you have a block or unblock, make sure you check the unblock. Check it? Yeah, check unblock if that's an option. And then hit OK. And now in Amos, check to see if you have this plugin showing up. It should be called Pattern Matrix Model Builder. Does it show up for you? Honestly, I got lost. Okay, we'll do it again. Okay. I went through a lot of steps there. I have a, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, if we don't have the plugins, yeah. so the substitute for that would be to do what you just did. Manually. Well, right now it's a lot easier. Okay. So, so you, like, without a plugin, you can just do all that stuff. Oh, yeah, you can totally build it manually. Okay. And um, for today's at least, I'll save all the models I produce. And so if it's going too slow, you can just pull in my model that I'll make. So do you see the pattern matrix builder? Um, I want to try and restart Amos. Yeah, restart Amos and that might do it. Okay. For those who couldn't follow along because I went really fast, here's again how you did it. Um, go copy the plugin, right? Right click and copy. Uh, from the data folder or from the bootcamp folder and then go find uh, this location its operating system or local disk do you have that you're on a Mac yeah another issue are you in the Windows side of the Mac yeah so another thing is to, the way that I'm using my Kimbos and SGSS is through like a Oh. Yeah, so I don't like like if oh, I, I bet you can use plugins, plugins through the Citrix uh, server. Yeah, but I mean, if I want to do anything, like I have to connect it to files from like the data ledger. Oh, okay. so, you know, it's just like, I'm, like it won't. I doubt that'll work. Dang it! And does anyone have a Mac and they're using my plugins? <laughs> Dang! You know what? I I did. Yeah. But that's why I'm using the PC. PC All right. Uh, for those remotely as well, uh, if you're using a Mac and it's not, you don't have Amos on your Windows side of your Mac, assuming you have a Windows side of your Mac, um, I don't think the plugins will work actually. Or if you're using Citrix server, I don't know if it'll work. Um, so you'll have to follow along. Let me show you quickly manually how to do this. Um, I'm not going to build the whole thing, but you get the right idea. But I'll save my models that I create. Um, as we go along. So I'm going to do everything we do today. I'll do it the old-fashioned way and then the new way. But I'll only go a little bit down the old-fashioned way just to show you how to do it. Yeah. I see what Rob Warren did. He got us up into those files. He got it fixed. Yeah. He got it fixed. Yeah. Yeah. If you do run into issues with the plugins, there is a troubleshooting guide. Um, if you go to StatWiki and go to the plugins page, you can find a troubleshooting guide. So this is plugins, let's see, plugins info right here. Click on that, go to troubleshooting, and here's how to fix every issue that is most prominent. Yeah. What was the name of the plugin? Here? Pattern Matrix Model Builder. Oh. No, no, I'm using the Citrix. Oh, you're using the Citrix one, that's why. But not for Amos. Amos, they put oh. directly on the computer. Oh. Have to use the server for SPSS. Oh, huh. we'll, we'll I'll check it out later. So for now, you just have to follow along, uh, watching. Hello. Hi. Um, I got to the point where you get the you copy the file into the plugins file. Oh, you found the plugins folder. Nice. Yeah, great. What do you do after you get it copied? Yeah, once you get it in there, uh, you're gonna right click it. And uh, so you right click it, go to properties. Oop, stop. Ah. Right click, go to properties. And then at the bottom, there might be an unblock checkbox. Uh -huh. If there is, check that box. And then hit OK. Apply. Yeah. 
and then hopefully uh, it'll show up in your Amos plugins. If not, restart Amos if it should be there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's go back to Amos. Uh, you never redid. Oh, never, oh, you want to see it again. That's right, sorry. Uh, so, to find the location. Yeah. So the location is operating system, uh, let's see, local disk C, users, and then your username. And then you have to view hidden items. So go to the view tab up top and check the box for hidden items. And then you should see a folder called app data. Open that up and then local. And then Amos development, and then Amos, and then the highest number there, and then plugins, and there you are. They hit it real good. They even made it a hidden folder. They also changed the uh, structure around the plugins so that my old plugins don't work on the new versions of the software. So we had to recreate all the plugins. You're welcome. I, it's, it's easier. Crazy. I don't know if it's easy, but yeah, it's easier for sure. I remember I was sitting in a class, a stats class that was using Amos, and we were doing everything like I'm about to show you the slow way. I thought, this is stupid. There's got to be a better way. So is there a difference between EQS and Amos? Oh, lots of differences between EQS and Amos, but the algorithms are almost the same. Uh, Amos uses maximum likelihood, whereas EQS uses, what's it called? Um, a different one, I think. <laughs> I can't remember which equation. Uh, but it'll come up with roughly the same results. Yeah. Okay, so if you need to build the model manually, here's how you do it. Those with the plugin, don't, don't bother doing this, but those who need to build it manually, what you got to do is look at your pattern matrix, which I saved over here in the data folder. And if you go back to the data folder oh, in chat, let's see. If anyone needs help getting the question mark removed, uh, please feel free to contact me. Yep, and there's a troubleshooting guide for it too. Okay, um, the pattern matrix is this SPV file in the data folder, so you'll want to open that up. And it's just our latest EFA run. This is what you want to see. And you're going to build your CFA based on this. Um, those with the plugin, hold tight for a sec. Those without the plugin, uh, follow along if you're following along. So the way you do it is you want to convert, convert, you want to transfer every latent variable over to Amos. So every latent variable is every column. And so the first column is usefulness. And so we're going to put usefulness one through seven in a latent factor over here. So we click on the candelabra, just click, don't click and drag. And then click and drag here to get the right size um, latent factor. And then it had seven items. Seven, oh, that's eight, whoops. And then Oh, we got to pull our data in as well. So everybody has to do this, even if you have the plugin. Pull your data in. Goes like this. Go to File, Data Files. Things are going to be uh, understandably slow as we get into the new software. So File, Data Files. And then click on File Name to go find your data set. The data set I'm using is the clean 2018... Um, Data set. This one, bootcamp original trimmed, 2018 clean. How do you produce the uh, the questions coming from the latent variables? Oh, oh, I'll show you. Um, okay. Uh, so it's this candelabra. If you just uh, if you click, 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 just keep clicking, just keep clicking on the latent variable. Yeah. Um, okay. So we pulled in the data. That's file data files. Click file name. Go find your data. Um, and then pull it in. And then your data will show up in this um, white stacky thing, which is uh, the 
list of variables in the data set. It's this white stacky thing, if you click that. And you'll just pull variables, click and drag, pull it into the uh, observed variable box. Oh, dang. Some of you may be experiencing this, where it pulls in the entire label. Let's fix that. You would go to View, Interface Properties. Why that's the default. Go to mis Miscellaneous tab, and uncheck the Display Variable Labels. So that's, uh, again, View, Interface Properties, Miscellaneous tab, uncheck display variable labels. Okay, and then it'll just put the variable name in there. We gotta put useful two in here and three. So you manually drag these out one at a time. Can you imagine if you have 100 variables? Yeah. That's one factor. We also need to rotate it. Here's a rotating tool right here under the fire truck. <coughs> click, click, click. Who is doing this manually? No people? Okay. Slow me down if I'm going too fast. Once you have it rotated, you want to double click the latent factor to name it. This will be useful. And it's variable name. We get in trouble. Oh, do I have one called useful already? It did not know when I tried that because it was too close to what the Items were called. It did not like it. Well, we'll find out. We'll find. Out. I like living on the edge. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so, essentially, you're going to do this for every factor in your data set. I'm just going to pretend I have factors here. Um, let me move this over here. The way to move things, by the way, is with the fire truck. And if you want it to move all together, you have to use the balloons to keep it together. This is the balloons. <laughs> yeah, so that moves things all together. If you don't have the balloons checked, it goes like this. Whee! Which is not what you want. Uh, and then, so let's pretend we have a few of these. Um, that's not the one I want. Is this the one I want? That's not the one I want. This is the one I want. Uh, let's pretend we have a few of these. Control Z. Um, Once we have a few of these, you want to co-vary all of the dependent, all of the latent factors. And so you can do this. You, you can do this using the finger selector and clicking each latent factor so they're blue. And then this plugin should work because it's a built-in plugin to draw covariances. As plugins draw covariances. Those who are doing it manually, do you have that plugin? No? The plugin is there, yeah, but I can't get yeah. the data file in. Oh, you can't get the data file in? No. Well, dang. <laughs> what? Are you using a Citrix server version or local copy? All right, give me a sec. Okay, I'm going to walk around. Um, those who couldn't get the plugin to work for this, you can actually just draw these covariances with a double-headed arrow. You're gonna click and drag from one to another, like that. Click and drag. Okay. So this is what I ended up with when I brought in the Okay, so and now file, data file. Yep, and then go file name. And then go file data set. And 
then use the words and hit OK. Right? Yes. All right, cool. And now, uh, oh, you brought it in here. You want it in here. Go to file new and do that again. Sorry. You want it in here. Yeah, file new. And then specific files. Specific files. files. Except it says there's no data in it. So the, there's click and then there's click and drag. Click would do this. Click and drag lets you set how big it's going to be. Um, so click and drag over here. But this is a CFA minus all the data. Um, so those who are doing this manually, you can see why I created a plugin. Um, before we move forward and I save a new model that you can just download for yourself, uh, do you have any questions before we move forward? Okay, then I'm going to use the plugin and make a model that you can just download so you don't have to build it all yourself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to delete this real quick. Um, the plugin allows you to take the pattern matrix here. And just paste it into Amos, and it creates the model for you. So to do that, assuming you have the plugin that works, um, you right-click the pattern matrix and copy, and then over in Amos, assuming you've pulled the data in, so file data files, and you have the data set already in here. Assuming your data is in here, you can go to plugins, and then pattern matrix builder, 
paste your pattern matrix in there and just hit create diagram. Um, boom. Wow. Oh my God. So awesome. And it creates it all pretty and symmetric for you. They have no interest in negotiating with terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> None at all. Or with third party developers or whatever we're called. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, no interest in implementing this at all. Because I was stupid. <laughs> uh, okay. So that does that. Once you do that, though, you still have to rename some things and move things around. So if you've done this, if you have a model, I strongly recommend you rename your variables by double clicking them and changing their variable name so they're not numbers. So this would be useful. And then this one would be anxiety. <coughs> and playful. You know, we already have factors called these, don't we, from the yeah. factor scores. So we're gonna have to name this like playful X or something like that. Anxiety X, useful X. So it's a new unique name. Decision qual X. That makes a difference than what we just did back in SPSS. Yeah, because yeah, we named those factor scores these things already. So since we already have a, an observed variable named anxiety, we can't also have an unobserved variable named anxiety. If Amos gets confused easily. Info acquisition X and comp use X comp use. X. So D E C or D E S. Uh, this is positive pause X and social desirability neg X. Woo! So I'm going to save this. So anyone who's doing it manually, you can just use this file. Um, let me just do one more thing. Uh, I strongly recommend when you start your CFA to move the um, parameter constraint. You see this one here and one here, one here. Uh, there's, there has to be one parameter constraint per latent factor um, it, in order for Amos to run it. Part of the algorithm, it requires that value to be constrained. But you can move it around. I recommend you do move it from a path up to the latent variable level. So I'm just going to double click the latent variable, go to its parameters, and add a one. And click here, one, one. That's why. It, in order for Amos to run, it has to have a parameter constraint somewhere on the latent variable, um, whether that's on a path, and I'm clicking on these paths and deleting that constraint, or whether it's on the latent variable itself. Because of some of the analyses we're about to run, it makes more sense to have the constraint on the latent variable, not on the path, because we need to compare paths. And you can't compare a path when it's constrained to be one. Um, so we move that constraint around. And then, voila, you're, you're ready to, to roll. So I'm going to save this um, so everybody can use it. Let's see. Or so everybody who wasn't able to use the plugin can use it. I'm going to save this in the models folder, demo models. And I'll call this a CFA initial 2018. Okay, that model should be available for you. You'll probably have to uh, reset where the data is coming from. So once you open it up, make sure you go back to file data files and relink the data if, uh, if you need to. Oh, using Amos is exhausting. <laughs> And the sad thing is, it's still better than the alternative. <sighs> so it's an improvement. Okay. I uh, did that model come through for anyone who's trying to use it. It's called uh, CFA Initial 2018. It should be, let's see. It's in the demo models folder. Okay. And it's called CFA Initial 2018. Yeah, it'll say it's an audio file because your computer doesn't recognize Amos files yet. Um, cause, so, um, yeah, that's the right one. So right click it. And say open with Amos. It's not an option. Nice. Uh, so instead, just go to Amos and open it directly. 
Yeah, go to images, yep. And then go to file, open. Save this, and then just go find it in the Attainment Camp models folder. <laughs> like I said, it's gonna be a little slow going as we get started, but once we get going, we'll be able to go a little faster. This is why we spend a whole day on CFA, though. It's just getting to know Amos. <sighs> We're recording right now, so I won't respond to that. <laughs> so the slow way of doing it is you bring in each of all those, and it's a two-way arrow in between everything. Yep, between every latent factor. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty slow. And then also, all the error terms need to be named, um, which you can do with a plugin. You can do plugin name unobserved variables. And that will name all of your errors consistently as E1, E2, E3. Um, yeah. How many lines of code did, it, did you have to write? To make, to make this, uh, it was about 350-ish. Not, It wasn't too long. Yeah. PJ got it pretty explicit though in the last residency though that we should do that. We should put the variance constraint on. Yep, we should. For uh, for metric invariance, yeah. Okay, how are we doing? Did it come in? Actually, have that picture. Woo! Okay, we good. We good. Ish. Okay. All right. Moving forward. So this is the CFA. Once you get here, there's a heap of stuff we can do. Um, first off, make sure you're good and saved. Uh, make sure it's saved outside of that shared Google Drive folder because I'm going to be manipulating the one in the Google Drive folder. Um, but the first thing you want to do is click on the colored abacus, which is right here, because that makes perfect sense. Colored abacus. What this is, is it's the properties of the analysis we're about to run. So first thing you want to do, go to the output tab and do a little TurboTax. Here we go. We want standardized estimates in that output tab. You have analysis properties, output tab, standardized estimates. And that's probably all we need right now, actually. You can keep minimization history, that's fine. And then there's no OK button, you just hit X. Because they don't follow conventions, UI conventions. Um, and save again, and we're going to run this model. The way to run it is with the non-colored abacus right here under the magic wand. So you just click on that. It thinks for a sec. Tells you, no good. You have no license. I have a license. Give me a sec. I'm just going to close Amos, reopen it. <laughs> Amos, Amos gives us he gives all sorts of weird errors, one of which is you have no license. <laughs> that might be, might be an issue. Might be. It does. But it ran this time, no problem. I have a license. You shall not pass. So what did you click? I clicked. The colored in the colored abacus, I went to the output tab. And then just check the box for standardized okay. estimates. And you left minimization? Yeah. And then just click the X. And then you click the unstandardized, or not, you click on the uh, uncolored abacus, black and white abacus under the magic wand, and then it runs, and nothing happens. So you have to click the up arrow to make something happen. There it is. Which arrow you click? The up arrow up here, um, up top. So this up arrow displays data on the model. And the data it displays is unstandardized. So we actually want to also go down here and click on standardized estimates instead of unstandardized. And that's going to switch what's displayed to be standardized. And let's walk through what all this is. We have a chat real quick. Let's see. I know I asked this before at least twice, but I want to make totally sure. 
for the CFA, we include moderators and control variables that are on a Likert scale latent variables. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, in the CFA, we include everything that was in the EFA. And what was in the EFA? All of our reflective latent factors, whether they were markers or moderators or mediators or dependent variables or control variables, if they're latent and we're gonna use them in a latent fashion um, and they're reflective, they belong here in the CFA. Uh, do formative factors belong in the CFA? Because we excluded them from the EFA. In the CFA, it's also built on the covariance matrix. And so, no, formative factors do not belong in AMOS uh, at all. Because AMOS is a, what's called covariance-based structural equation modeling application. <clears throat> and formative factors aren't built on the assumption of covariance. Okay, so let's look at what this all means. Um, if you zoom in just by scrolling up, uh, you'll see that the paths here have regression weights displayed. Um, we want these weights roughly averaging out above 0.7, sort of like in our pattern matrix. And then the covariances here, these are actually correlations, not covariances. Um, there's a slight difference, it's the square. Uh, anyway, we want the correlations here to be not enormous, uh, not above 0.8. Uh, and we can see the strongest co correlation is this one here, 0.69. That's pretty high. Um, all the rest are pretty good. So the reason you don't want them high is because you don't want to have what's called discriminant validity issues. Uh, you want to make sure these variables are unique, they're not <coughs> the same thing. Um, anyway, but that's just a rough look. What we need to do now is we need to assess whether the model is good, or whether the factors are valid, and whether we can proceed with a causal model. To do that, yeah. If I have a point A. Correlation? Yeah, maybe it's the same factor. Yeah, if you have a point A correlation, either you're experiencing uh, two factors that are actually measuring the same thing, or two factors that are, that are measuring two components or dimensions of the same thing. So it might actually just be a second order factor. Um, these are just its dimensions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first things first, uh, if you don't know where to start, go to the stat wiki. That's why I made it. And go to general guidelines, order of operations. Go find CFA, here's the CFA. What do I do first? Obtain a roughly decent model quickly. Check model fit and validity. Okay, let's do that. Um, for those who can use the plugins, there is a plugin uh, that does all of this for us, but let's start manually. Manually, if we want to check validity, essentially you do what you just did. You look at each factor, make sure it has roughly averaging out to 0.7 um, or above loadings, and then make sure its co correlations aren't too high. Um, you could also, oh, we could use a stats tool. That doesn't require, hmm. You could do this as well. Do this if you can't use the plugins. Um, go find the stats tools package Excel file, which is also in the SEM bootcamp right here. Stats tools package, XLSM. And make sure you grab that. If you open that up, we've automated some things. Well, it's a slower automation, but you can still use it if you can't use the plugins. No, oh, whoops, I already have it open somewhere else. There it is. Uh, when you open it, you should see something like this. Bunch of tabs, bunch of tools. Um, and you wanna go to the Validity Master tab. It's the first tab. How many are going this route so I know how fast to go? Okay, only if you're not using the plugins. If you can use the plugins, don't do it this route. There's a better way. Um, okay, so were you able to find the file? We're good? Not good. Mine? You, sir, were you able to find the file? You sir, could you find them? Are you doing it this way? Yeah, I, yeah. You found the file? Oh, good. You good, Marie? I have that open, yeah. 
Good. That's what I wanted to hear. All right. Now, go to your model. Click on the output, which is not that one. It is this one. It's uh, right next to the save floppy disk. There's a view text. And it's going to pop up this thingy, hopefully. And then you want to go to the, this is all the output for the model. Uh, you want to go to the estimates area and scalars. And you can see it produces regression weights, standardized regression weights, covariances, correlations, and variances. Again, that's estimate. Let me zoom in. This is really tiny. Okay. Estimates, scalars, and then all this stuff. What we want in the stats tools package is exactly what it says. Paste correlations table in A2. So we're going to go to the correlations table right here by clicking on correlations. You're going to left click outside of it and then right click to copy this table. And then you're going to go paste it over here like that. We're going to do the same with the standardized regression weights table in F2. Standardized regression weights, copy it, paste it over in F2. Once you've done that, click on this button. <laughs> and this button runs a bunch of stuff for you and produces a correlation matrix, um, and as well as the composite reliability score, the average variance extracted score, and a few other things that we're not going to pay attention to. Um, here's the correlation matrix, as well as the square root of the AVE on the diagonal. So this is a standard table you need to stick in any quantitative uh, article. My analyst was getting error when I tried to put the, what I guess we're calling the on-colored abacus. Oh. And so I couldn't even get the it won't run. To, oh. to, to, um, so this is what I was able to get. And when I put that, I get this error. It says it can't find, oh, so you got to relink the data. Hit OK. And you go back and relink the data, file data files. Yeah. And then go find the data again, file name. And then just send the data. It's because it's, it's trying to find it on my computer because it's my uh, I Amos file. Oops. I linked it from my own okay. Dropbox. So, um, yeah. he explained it straight from the Cool. That'll work. You got me open. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and this time it worked. Yeah. And hit, no, don't hit file name. Then go down to see if they just replaced the And then hit OK. And now run. And now run the on. Mm -hmm. Yep. Woo, ran. Okay. And then you click on the output over here, um, right there. Thank you. Oh. And then. Same issue. issue? All right. Sorry, remote folks. I'll be back. Yeah, I'm almost there. So, so what the fuck? 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 No, it's not called model. Yeah. 
Okay. So, what is the status of, of where? How how are we doing? Uh, we're having fun. We love it when we're bonding. When the staff tool package and the plugin match. It's exciting. It's yes, that exciting. is good when it works. So, let me explain what we have here real quick. What we have here is a brief assessment, just sort of a quick overview of the validity of the model of the factors. Um, so we have all the latent factors here and their CR, which is like chromex alpha, which you want above 0.7. So all of these should be above 0.7. If they're not, they turn red. Um, and so social desirability, positive and negative, both red. They're also both pretty close. So I'm not too worried. It's a marker variable. It's not a key theoretical variable. Um, so I'm not too uh, miffed about that. AVE should be above 0.5. Again, all of them are except the social desirability, so not a big deal. Um, the square root of that AVE is on the diagonal here, and this has to be greater than any correlation with another latent factor. So for example, the square root of the AVE for social desirability neg x is 0.553. It's got to be greater than its correlation with any other latent variable here. And it is. So we're good. This implies discriminant validity. Uh, CR implies reliability. ABE implies uh, convergent validity. So we're actually pretty good. Why are we so good? It's because we did a good EFA. If we hadn't spent time in the EFA, this would have been a mess. So hypothetically, yeah. would a, would a 0.5 uh, positive reliability factor B also close enough for your um, social desirability? For social desirability, 0.5 is pretty low. Um, so that's a little questionable. Uh, but you could try to write it off. Say it's just a marker variable anyway. Okay. But and, and the same for the ABE. If it's, okay. if it's a little low, yeah. 0.3. 0.3. Yeah, it's a little low, just, but just write it off as a marker variable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's validity. You also got to check the model fit roughly. Wait, um, uh, I have this trouble that I uh, um, and with only two two factors. Uh huh. Because oh, if only two factors, that doesn't work. Yeah, but yeah. 
I made uh, some model of uh, an Excel. Uh -huh. So for ABE <coughs> is the uh, sum of the squares. I have a tool that'll do it for just two. Yeah. yeah. Also, do the plugins work for you or no? No, plugins don't work for you? Okay, so I have a tool for you. Um, if you go, if you only have two latent factors, go to the stats tools package old. Yeah. Yeah, it'll do all the calculations for you. And in the stats tools package old, go to the validity tab and then enter your standardized loadings here and your correlation here. So let's say we only had uh, let me get rid of this. Only one correlation. It still produces CR and ABE for you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, also, those who are using the plugin, this is how it looks. Go to plugins, uh, validity and reliability test. And it'll think about it and produce this. Same findings, um, but it also gives you recommendations, this one. Uh, so it says, well, these two are having problems. You might consider dropping social desirability 4 and 10. Why would it suggest that? So we go look here at social desirability 4 at the bottom here. Let's zoom in, go down. It was 10 and 4. Here's 10, a loading of 0.36. And here's 4, a loading of 0.48. So those are the two. Now, we're not so concerned about our mark variable being super uh, strong and valid. It's really a, just a tool for method bias, which we'll talk about later. Um, so I'm actually going to just leave these as is. Yeah? Since it, the social desirability is a mark variable, could you have chosen either one or the other of those other than maybe both? Right. We could have chosen one or the other, but two is better um, because it makes it a more robust tool for extracting just method bias rather than shared trait variance. So the more, the, the larger your marker variable, the better. Yeah. And let's say hypothetically we did remove 4 and 10. It, it's still yeah, if we remove 4 and 10, you're still good. It, right. You're making it less powerful, but it still should work. Okay. Yeah. What was the name of that validity, reliability plugin? Oh, it's uh, in the folder. It's called... It's model though. Yeah, model validity. Oh, I, mine's called val master validity. Master validity. And the most recent one's called Amos dash master validity. So, uh, Ryan, if you were looking for the newest version. Yeah. Yeah. Still throwing the same error. Weird. Okay. Yeah, I've got on the spreadsheet something. Okay. Yeah, the spreadsheet should be the same. Okay. So, that's that. We also have to test the model fit roughly just to make sure there's no major issue with model fit. Oh, sorry. There's text chat let's see Robert what's the deal with the P next to the DF is it supposed to be over a point oh we haven't gotten there yet I'll tell you in a minute if you remove 4 or 10 do you have to go back and look at the model fit or even go back and redo the EFA you so what this is a really good and valid question um, let's say we remove items during the CFA do we have to go back and redo the EFA? The answer is no. Uh, we, we're done with the EFA. It, it was a tool for exploring our factor structure. Um, now that we have it, we're good. We, we're done. We don't have to go back to the EFA at all. Okay, my heart is skipping a lot. Uh, let's run through this last bit and then we'll take a two minute break. Um, <laughs> it was, every time Rob texts me, yeah, my, my, my heart skips. <laughs> you make my heart flutter, Rob. <laughs> um, weak in the okay, knees. You have to let us see the comments. Oh. <laughs> All right. Oh, oh here he goes. Uh oh. And there it goes again. Ah, man. My heart just skipped again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Here we go. Um, we also have to test model fit. So you can do this by looking the, at the output again. In the output, if you go to the model fit section, it's not in the estimate section, it's uh, below it down here called model fit. Over here, you get a bunch of output. Um, since we're just doing a cursory glance right now, um, we don't have to like do a full analysis. Here's what you're looking for. Rob, to answer your question, the p-value for the c-min, which is the chi-square, 
um, it should be above 0.05, but it is a really, really, really strict measure of model fit and highly biased by model complexity and sample size. The more complex your model, meaning the more variables that are in it, and the higher your sample size, the higher your chi-square. Look at my chi-square, it's 1,500, it's pretty big. Um, and so the p-value is very susceptible to deflation due to complexity and sample size. So we may never reach a 0 0.05 with this kind of complex model. So this uh, variable, uh, this metric, has since uh, lost credibility in the literature, and we don't typically use this. We report it, but we say, but look at the CFI, the SRMR, and the RMSCA, which are considered the more recent. And again, this depends on your field. <laughs> uh, this is in information systems and uh, more business school disciplines. Other disciplines uh, like the like the NFI, the TLI, uh, some of the other older measures. But in business, we use the CFI, which we want above 0.9, ideally above 0.95, but 0.9 will do. Um, and then the if we scroll down, hey, yeah. Hypothetically, everything looks good, but your GFI stinks. GFI is old. Yeah, ignore GFI. Look at RMSEA, it should be uh, less than, depending which literature you cite, less than 0.06. Um, this one is, so we're good. And the P close should be greater than uh, 0.05, so we're good. So this model is actually pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. In fact, if we wanted to make it perfect, which I don't recommend, by the way, we're not optimizing model. But if you wanted to see where could I improve it, you could click on this modification indices option here in the analysis properties. I'm gonna bump mine up to 40 because we have a complex model. Sorry, I went fast there. I'm just showing you, you don't have to follow along with this part because I'm not recommending it. I'm just showing it. But if you look at the output now with modification indices run, there's a modifica modification indices portion. And it says, well, E19 and E20 are really related. So are E3 and E4. If we go back and look at the variables there, 19, 20, 3, and 4. Here's three and four right here. It's useful three and useful four. If we were to go look at the wording for useful three and useful four, to do here's useful three. Let me zoom in. Using Excel in my work increases my productivity. Using Excel enhances my work effectiveness. Those are the same thing. Of course they're related. Now, what do we do? Let's say we didn't have model fit as high as we wanted and we needed to improve it. Well, we have an indication here that three and four are causing a problem with model fit. They're too strong, strongly related, and yet they are not connected directly with the line. <clears throat> the best approach when you have this many uh, items on a re reflective latent factor is to simply lop one off. Um, so I'd take the one with the lower loading, which is here's 93, here's 91. I'd get rid of three. Just take it out of the family. But since we already have good fit, we're good. We don't have to do that. Um, don't try to optimize your model. Uh, you want to err on the side of not removing items if you can help it. With, with that said, if you were, if, if you took that approach and you did take a couple outs, incremental covariance, and you saw only incremental value by model fit, I put it back in. You put it back in. Yeah. If if we took one out here, for those who couldn't hear on remote, if we took out three here, and uh, our model fit didn't improve, I just stick three right back in. The other one was uh, 23 and 24, right? I think so. Decision quality eight and nine, which are? Just out of curiosity, put them back in, you have to rerun, you have to reload the pattern matrix. Uh, no, you don't have to rerun the pattern matrix. We're done with the EFA. No, 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 I'm sorry. To put them back in, if you do that, you have to reload the pattern matrix? Like no, you, you, you can just add them out. manually, like that. Uh, use the candelabra. I'll show you, I'll just show you. One moment. Sorry. You're good. Um, yeah. Excel helps me make higher quality decisions. Excel helps me in my decision analysis process. So these are sort of the same. Yeah, let's take one out here. I'll show you. If I were to take one out using this X marks the spot thing after hitting the down arrow, because you can't mess with the model while the up arrow is up, uh, click on the X and you get rid of three. I click on the three itself and also get rid of the E3, which was connected to it. Um, let's go look what happens to our CFI, it was what, 937 or 927 or something like that? 
model fit. CFI is now 930. So it was 927 before is my guess. Um, that really didn't make much of a difference. If I want to add usefulness three back in, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the candelabra here and just click on usefulness again. And it creates another one down there. Um, so it created a new empty one down here. Yeah. And then I can just pull usefulness three back in. Usefulness three. Whoop. Oops. Too big. Usefulness three. Put it back. And it's ugly, but it'll do. And we can name this whatever it was, E3. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And there's that. So we have a good model. That's what we have to do first. Just check, make sure things are valid. If they're not, address them. How do we address them? Uh, the, mo the model fit or the validity master plugin tells you how to address them. But essentially, if you have discriminant validity problems, what you need to do is try to, fi try to find a way to decrease the correlation between the variables that have a discriminant validity problem. For example, let me run this again. Um, hit the up arrow. Here we go. Up arrow, standardized. Uh, the highest correlation we had was right here. Let me zoom in right here. Um, between decision quality and information acquisition. Um, there are two ways we can address the discriminant validity problem. One is uh, to try to increase convergent validity because as we increase the AVE, <clears throat> our correlation between two factors can be higher and still be good. Um, because what it is, discriminant validity, if we go back here, is just the comparison of the square root of the AVE to the actual correlations. So if our AVE is higher, we can have higher correlations and still be discriminant. So one way to do that is to drop some of the lower loading items, like information acquisition five. If I drop this, my AVE would increase probably. And then that correlation between these two is, assuming it didn't move, would now not be such of a problem. Um, the other option is to take these two into Excel, like, or not into Excel, into um, SPSS again, and run an EFA with just these two, and let all the cross loadings show, and see where the biggest cross loadings are, and then try to pull them apart even further by removing the items with the greatest cross loadings. And that will decrease the correlation between these two factors. And then change the CFA to match that new, uh, those new findings. Does that, questions about that? I sort of glossed over that quickly. Go ahead. Discriminant validity problems, try to decrease the correlation. Convergent validity problems, try to increase the loading average value. And one way to do that is to just drop the lowest loading item. So, there you have it, yeah. Um, since you've done a lot of CFEs, um, you know, you kind of know what's going to maybe come after this. Yep. Do you try to, uh, I mean, look at some of the weaknesses of this one before you move forward? And the modification indices certainly would show some of the ways that the items are not behaving as well as you'd like them to. So, so you just don't address that yet, but then you may address it later. So for those on the remote side who couldn't hear, uh, the question was, how much do we try to fix now when we're just sort of doing a rough high-level pass um, before we go and do complicated things like scalar and variance and method bias and all that junk? Um, the answer is, unless I see a real red flag, I don't do anything now. If model fit's good enough, validities are close enough, I don't mess with it. And most of what you do in the EFA uh, really sets you up nicely to have a clean CFA so that you don't have to mess with it much. Um, you'll notice in this model that we have, we didn't have to do any adjusting to reach a good fit or good validity. So going through the model phase, should we include at least the style rates to the components? I'd say again? Would you include the least style rate? This diagram? Yeah. Like in your report? Yes. Oh, no. 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 Correlation matrix with the CR and the ABE, that's sufficient. That's and model fit. So that table is okay. Yeah. No, don't you don't need a picture of your model. Okay. No. So. The, the exception to that is if you had a second order factor, it would be helpful to see that. 
I, yeah. I, I'm on those last second order. Okay, yeah, if you had a second order factor, because that's a little different and visual it would help. In that case, table's a little harder to read second order factor. The second order, that would be the structure model, it's not on the model. Oh, it could be a, in the measurement model as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you that in a little bit. Or if we end up using Marie's model later, we could do it with hers. Yeah. Is there any way when, when you save these to not create all those gazillion other files that you don't need? All those uh, little log files and block files and no, it's going to clutter up your folder. Yeah, Amos creates a bunch of uh, remnants as what well, little artifacts. You can delete them though. The only only files you do need are the AMW file and SAP file. Okay. Anything else before we start doing crazy hard stuff? Because this was easy. Hi. I have this uh, trouble because in psychology we use a different sample to make the complementary factorology. Yeah. So I think the trouble that I'm having here is that uh, the second sample increased different range of age. So I think that my trouble is that the response to the items was different. From one sample to another. Okay, so uh, for the remote folks, uh, in other fields and even in business, um, the more rigorous approach is to do an EFA with a random sample of your data set and then do the CFA with a different random sample of the data set or a separate data set entirely. Uh, same variables, just different people, different respondents. Uh, that's considered more rigorous. Unfortunately, in many cases, the liberty to do that is not available because you don't have enough data and you don't want to run it with, let's say you have a hundred uh, in your sample size, you don't want to cut your sample size in half because uh, then you lose stability. So in most, uh, at least in business contexts, we just use the whole data set for the whole analysis all the way through. Um, if you are splitting your data set, it's really important to run a Levine's homogeneity of variance test in SPSS prior to using uh, that other sample in the CFA. Do you know what, have you seen a Levine's test before? No? Let me show you real quick. This is important for anyone to consider who's gonna be doing this. But real quick, let me answer Robert. If one was working on an academic paper and the journal allowed 20 pages of appendices, would you put the measurement model in the appendix? Uh, a picture of it, no. The reports about it, sure. If you wanna put a picture of it, go for it. But you don't have to. When uh, the, my favorite hypothetical uh, Capstone last year had no appendices. It was a really? 20 page report, no appendices. Really? Anyway, all right, let me. Um, How would Bill Brake feel about that? Hypothetically. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, let me do the Levine's test real quick. Um, so, when you have multiple uh, groups, whether, uh, like, this, this often happens when you have multiple data collection runs. So, I, uh, you collect data from, uh, let's say, this company and then you collect the same data from this company um, or this group and that group. Whenever you do that, you have different data collection phases. You need to run what's called a homogeneity of variance test, which I'm just gonna make up for a moment. Um, I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna create a new variable just to represent this thing. Uh, group, no, something like that. Uh, and I'm gonna create data for this so everybody in the first half is going to be group num zero. Whee! Okay, these people are group num zero, and then group num two, one. Uh, group num one is going to be everybody else. Really, you would do this based on actual data collection. I'm just making up groups right now. So it's like phase one, phase two or group one, group two, company one, company two. You go to analyze, compare means, one way ANOVA. And in this, what you want is in the post hoc, where'd you go, where'd you go? Options, here it is, in the options, homogeneity of variance test. Um, it's in the options button. Homogeneity of variance test. And what this does is it tests whether um, all of the items in your factor analysis, so I'm gonna throw all these items in here, based on this group num in the factoring box, 
are those items variances the same or different across these two groups? Um, in your case, it would be sample one, sample two. Assuming you have them in the same data set, you'd probably have to combine data sets if, if they're not. You hit OK. Um, the test runs. Here's the homogeneity variance test. What we want to see is, oh, they added to this. That makes it way more complicated. But basically, you want to see, let me go up here, you want to see non-significant differences is what you want to see, uh, greater than 0.05. Um, and so anxiety, we're good, uh, except here, dang, anxiety too was answered differently by my two uh, groups, even though they were just randomly, yeah, well. So anxiety five's good, but uh, the, the, th the rule of thumb is if at least one variable in a latent factor is invariant, uh, not different, between the two groups, then you're good to go. So in this case, uh, we have anxiety five, totally not different, we're good. Then I go into comp use, uh, comp use one, totally good, even though a couple of the others are not. Um, but the, you get the idea. But if you find that um, for a whole set of indicators, there is complete difference between the two groups, you have p-values less than 0.05, um, then you're in trouble then you got to figure out what to do next because um, those samples did not understand the questions or at least did not respond to the questions in a similar fashion. Um, and so either it's a limitation or you got to drop that uh, factor, which is not ideal, obviously. But any, uh, any analyses you run going forward will be subject to that limitation. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, back to uh, CFA. I wouldn't have taken the time to do that if it weren't important. That's uh, Levine's homogeneity of variance test. I think that is important stuff whenever you have multiple groups uh, or multiple data collection phases. How is that different than scalar? It is essentially a metric invariance test in an EFA. And we're going to do the same thing in a CFA. Yeah. Professor, is it necessary to do the dynamic model? The dimensionality. Yeah. Wait, sorry, where? Oh, yeah, so we're going to do that. Invariance test. Yeah, the scalar invariance, unit dimensionality. We're going to do that. That's going to be probably next, right? Yeah. Let's see. If we go to the order of operations, let's see. CFA, here it is configurable metric and scalar invariance. Okay. Yep, dimensionality. If that's what you're talking about. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Okay. If not, we can do something else. Um, so the next thing is, if you have multiple groups and you're testing hypotheses based on those multiple groups, um, and in our in our model we are. If we go back to our model here, um, whoops, here. The model we're pretending to use during this boot camp is right down here. We said there is multiple groups, uh, male and female. We're saying this model differs between male and female. Um, and if we're going to make causal claims based on multiple groups, we also need to test our measurement model to make sure it is the same for both groups. Because if it's not the same, then any uh, findings we have based on those multiple groups are suspect. Uh, we can't have confidence in them because we don't know that the measures used in each group are the same. It'd be like me giving apples to the men in the room and oranges to the women in the room and then asking how much they liked fruit, the fruit I gave them. And they had totally different fruit. And so the, whatever hypotheses I made about men and women liking fruit the same or different would be invalid because they didn't have the same measure. That's what this is for. Okay. So this is unnecessarily complicated. Um, what you got to do, and we're try I tried to simplify it, a little bit, but I don't have a plug-in for this yet. Um, but Amos does, so we'll be okay. What you gotta do, let's save this as a different model real quick. Save as uh, invariance, CFA invariance 2018. And now this model is available. If you wanna wait till I add the groups, you can wait or you can do it with me. But now we're gonna add groups to this data. Oh, 
Actually, we're going to take a three minute break. Yeah. Okay. Three minute break, remote folks. And I'm going to eat a gummy bear. Thanks. That's a banana there. Holy cow. Um, uh, did you get to go on a walk or a bike ride yesterday? No, but I did, I did walk a little bit last night after dinner, but it's starting to dark now. Yeah. I'm going to get to some of the things I can't But um, tomorrow morning. Considering it's not pouring on you. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, but I'm here till Sunday. So. Did you see the mountains at 8 o'clock? Last night? Yeah. Yes. 8 o'clock. Yeah, I was They glow. Right. From 8 to 8.45, the mountains glow orange and pink because the sun is behind the mountains over there, but it's still hitting the mountains over here. Yeah. And so it's, it's dark, not dark, it's shaded in the valley, but the mountains are glowing. You got to see the mountains at 8 o'clock. How you doing? Especially in the morning, too. Is there a piece of bread? The sun comes up. He's calling me. Oh, he's coming up. 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 He's coming
I think the reason that they're required is more just the you I so, okay, so I Yeah. 
What is his name? Richard? Or maybe even going at your service statistics. Because that's like, you know, that's the system. There's a book that writes the leadership of the right person. Okay. Yeah, started sorry for the long delay um we're good here okay invariance so there are three types of invariance that actually are more but there are three that i care about actually there's zero that i care about but there are three there are three that we should probably cover that's what i'm trying to say i'm recording that's right who actually watches these? Only tens of thousands of people. <laughs> um, who sympathize with me? Uh, anyone who, who would disagree probably won't watch it. Um, okay. Watch it Oh, maybe. All right, anyway. So there are three types of invariants. One is scalar, one is configurable, one is metric. If you want to know what they are, if you go to the stat wiki, um, let me go here, stat wiki. And if you were to go to the CFA section, there's a section on measurement model invariance and you can see definitions of each and videos on how to do it all um, and what to do if things fail so let's do this first off we got to bring our groups in to do that double click group number one or whatever your group number is our moderating variable is gender so i'm going to put male here and then make a new model or new group sorry and say female, 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 and then hit close. If you accidentally hit new again, um, then just click on your extra model that you created and hit delete. So you should just have two groups here, male and female, if you're using that uh, data. And then um, we have to add the data to those groups. So if you go to where you add data, file data files, um, you'll see that we have data already added for the first group, males, but we need to add the same data set for females. Or if you have them in separate data sets, Amos can actually handle that as long as it's the same variables. So I'm gonna double click female and pull in the same data set. Oh, not the speed run data. Let me go back and get the right data. Data. It is this trimmed 2018 clean. And then once you have that, you actually have to separate these, uh, the data into groups here. So you click on grouping variable. For my top one, for the male group, 
I'll go find gender and hit OK. Same with female. Click on the female group, go to grouping variable, gender, OK. And then it would say, well, what value for gender? So you click on group, va group value. For males, it's in this data set, males, we have 287 of them. Um, hit OK. And then we click on the female group, group value, and two. There it is for 91 of them. So now we have our data set split by males and females. And so all the analyses we run in Amos from here forward will have this data split. We'll run two separate models, a model for males and a model for females. Hit OK. And I'm going to save this so that you guys will have it. It is now saved in the Google Drive if you need it. CFA Invari Invariance 2018. So once you do that, um, we need to assess configural metric and scalar invariance. To, con to assess configural invariance is super easy. Um, you just test the model fit again. So you can do that with a plugin or you can do it the old way I showed you. I'm just gonna show model fit here real quick. This is with the data separated. The question is, is model fit still good? Let's run in. And the model fit is still good, or acceptable at least, um, even when the, da the da data is separated. So this says we have configural invariance. Um, the two models run fine separately. They're appropriate for each gender, essentially. That's configural invariance. So what would you report? You'd report, we ran the model with the data split unconstrained, and the model fit was good. CMIN, DF, CFI, RMCA, SMR, something like that in parentheses uh, with the values. Yeah. What if your model fit wasn't good? If your model fit wasn't good at this point, um, you was it good during the initial run? So if it was good during the initial run and not good now, what you'd want to do is go look at the output and figure out with modification ind indices if possible where the biggest issues were for each group because it will differ. Notice in this group, it's E19 and E20. This is the male group down bottom left here. I'll show you. There's a group area, one for male, one for female. If I click on female um, or male, it'll show me the modification indices for just that group. So I'm on male right now, and it's E19 and E20 are the problem. Female, no problem. Hmm. It's because here's why. Well, yeah, the data set's small, and so the chi-square is small, and so the modification indices threshold was too big. So what you gotta do is in your analysis properties, colored abacus, go to the output tab in the modification indices area, um, change this threshold here. Instead of 40, change it down to like 10. Why? Because our chi-square for the female group is very small, uh, because it's a smaller number of females than males. So close that, run it again. Wait for it. Might be trying. I can run it too. It's still running. It never finishes? Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate. What is it? Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> slow computer? What did you get with like it gives you modification? It gives you all the input or output. <laughs> But it, on the default model, it still has the two X's. It doesn't say okay. You know what I mean? Oh. So it gives you the results, and there's nothing in the results that says, hey, bad, bad you. Yeah, don't worry about X's on the default model okay. for now. Uh, but if you were to look at modification indices again for the female group, here are the big ones. E9 and 12, and E22 and useful. Weird. Let's go yeah. look at that. E22 and useful. Where's E22? E22 is down here. Decision quality, seven, and useful. I wonder, how is decision quality seven worded? Here's, we know what useful means, right? It's a useful software. Here's decision quality seven. Excel helps me make more effective decisions. Sounds pretty useful, yeah, Excel. So our problem is decision quality seven is very similar to the useful measures. 
So what do we do? Yeah, if, if we got to meet this uh, configurable invariance test, uh, we'd have to delete decision quality seven. We have four more, so we're good. Um, the other option is throw decision quality and usefulness into an EFA. See where the cross loadings are and try to separate them. Not to the original EFA. Yeah, you go back to a new EFA. It's just a tool. You got to pick up your hammer again. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's what I would do is uh, either go back to a, a new EFA with just decision quality and usefulness or just drop the offending item. That would be the that's fastest. Kind of, that's kind of interesting because if you, if we're back to the CFA before, if we would have done a little bit of looking at the modifications before and actually cut some of those items out mm -hmm. earlier, we might not have a problem at this point. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to put that back, back in. And I, so if you have your base CFA model and you were to go back and trim that anyway, or take them, um, you were to take them out here now that you've added the two groups. The thing is, decision quality seven wasn't identified in our initial EFA or CFA as a problem. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's only a problem when you consider the groups separately. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was. We didn't look at the model. We didn't look at the modification. Not across groups, but we did. We did it in the initial CFA. Let's real quick. Let me save this. Um, we'll go back to the initial CFA 2018. Here it is. If we go look at the modification indices here, um, you'll see that. The usefulness was a seven. Um, usefulness seven shouldn't be a problem, which is where did we go? Usefulness seven. Oh, Hello. Quality seven. Sorry. E twenty two. I have a question, please. Yes, just a moment. Okay. Uh, e twenty two isn't listed here. Oh yeah. It's so it's not a major one, is what I'm trying to say. Let me go here and set this to twenty. We go modification indices and it was e22 there's this but that isn't a relationship with usefulness yeah e22 just shows up here with itself so we may have ended up addressing it there you're right yes Mukhtar yes I'm um, assuming we had a what do you call it a bad fit or relatively good fit. Uh, can, we, can we go to the modification indices and identify, uh, I mean, the key ones and Kobery, maybe just a few, one or two at maximum? So there's, uh, there are different schools of thought on whether you should just covary error terms. <clears throat> if you covary error terms, what it does is it accounts for the discrepancy between the chi-square, uh, the, the two covariance matrices that produce the chi-square. Um, but what you're doing is you're adding a totally artificial relationship in your model um, that doesn't exist in theory. And so it, while some say it's okay on occasion when the two variables uh, you're, you're connecting are highly related theoretically, uh, others would say, well, no, uh, it's still an artificial relationship and you shouldn't do that. Um, I tend to agree more and more these days with those who would say not to covary errors. It introduces problems later in your model, it makes things unstable, um, and it is totally artificial, especially when you have reflective model. Uh, the reflective model, those items are redundant. And so if you're seeing a strong covariance between the errors, it's because they're redundant. And so you might as well just remove one because it's redundant. Um, it'd be better to remove that item. The only exception, of course, is if you have three items and you don't want to remove and end up with two items uh, in your latent factor. And then you might just accept a lower threshold of model fit rather than covary the errors. Cool. Okay. Okay. So we addressed what to do if you don't get good model fit. Um, and But that's configurable invariance. And again, we're doing this because we have multiple groups, we're gonna test in our causal model and we have to make sure that they uh, understood the measures the same way. Should we report CFI in an academic journal? Heck yes. 
CFI should always be reported, according to this scholar. If someone didn't report CFI, I'd ask them to please include it. If they didn't include GFI, I wouldn't care. Okay. Hypothetically, would that be the consensus of those that may check a hypothetical? Uh, hypothetically, yeah. If you include SRMR, CFI, RMSEA, PCLOSE, you're good. Also report the chi-square degrees of freedom, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so PLS is different. Yeah. We'll talk about that Saturday. Right. We'll talk about that Saturday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more from chat. Um, Okay, what about if CFI is the only low score and it was because of a low loading on a something, oh, social desirability, which won't transfer over to the structural model anyway? Ah. Hmm. Ah. Hmm. Good question. Hypothetically. What was the question? The question was, what if you only have bad model fit because of your marker variable? Yeah. If it were me, I would with all confidence uh, delete the marker variable during my model fit assessment and then move forward. And just parenthetically note that you this is the model fit minus the marker variable. And I'd say it confidently and write it confidently and then wait to be reprimanded. Okay, here we go. And hope you have a kind reviewer. I, you know, it's funny. I, re I review, um, <laughs> can you cite me? Sure. Uh, I, I get asked to review papers constantly um, because of the statistics stuff. And the problem is when I review papers, I ignore all of their statistics because uh, I assume they did it right. I, I focus more on theory and uh, motivation and positioning and framing and the methods I assume are correct, which is probably not what the editors want. They probably want me to look at the methods. Anyway, okay, back to work. So that's uh, configurable invariance. We next need to do metric and scalar invariance, which there is a tool for this little uh, multi-group tool down here next to the copy machine, the fax machine. Is that a fax machine? Yeah. Okay. Printer. We'll call it a printer. Those are still somewhat relevant. Okay. So click on the multiple groups tool here. Um, and it's going to say there's only one group. Oops. I need to go back to my other model. Uh, that would be invariance. Where are you? Here. Make sure you're in the, you're in the invariance model. Okay, then click on the multiple groups. It's gonna say, we're gonna wipe all stuff you've included. Say yes, that's fine, okay. Okay, what we're doing in this is we're allowing Amos to run some chi-square difference tests between uh, unconstrained and constrained models, where the constrained models um, are forcing the male and female models to be equal to each other, and then comparing that to an unconstrained model where they're allowed to be freely estimated. Um, why are we doing this? And also, what is a chi-square difference test? Um, chi-square <clears throat> is, in, for lack of a better description, is a measurement of the amount of error produced when you compare the covariance matrix of all these variables that you're including in the model to the covariance matrix you're producing by modeling the variables in this way. It's the observed model versus the predicted model. Yours is the predicted, the observed is the natural cor correlations between variables. So when you compare those two, you literally just take a difference between those two uh, matrices, it produces a chi-square value, the size of the difference between the two matrices. There's a little bit more involved, but roughly that'll do. The bigger the difference, <coughs> the less your model fits the data. And if the model you're proposing doesn't fit the data, then there's probably a better model that you're not proposing. And so your model fit is poor. That's model fit chi-square. 
um, a chi-squared difference test says we have this proposed model and this proposed model, the unconstrained and the constrained models, let's compare those. Now is the size of the chi-square compared to its degrees of freedom significant or is it a nominal difference? Is the chi-square being produced, which again, chi-square is just the difference between two matrices, is that chi-square being produced a significant difference? Or does it represent something no different from zero? If it's no different from zero, there's no difference between these two models, therefore they are equivalent. That's a chi-square difference test, um, conceptually at least. I should make some slides for that. Anyway, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna run some chi-square difference tests. We're gonna say, here's male and female unconstrained. That's a model with a covariance matrix. Here's male and female constrained to be equal. Are these two types of reality compatible? If not, we don't have invariance. If they are, if the chi-square difference test turns up non-significant, then we're fine. So just gonna hit okay here. Once, what, do whatever it proposes here. Hit okay. It's going to label a bunch of stuff for you. And then you're going to run the model as is. And it's gonna take a moment to run because it's doing a lot of comparisons. Once it runs, you can go look at the output. And there's a new section called model comparisons. Oop, ah. Here it is, right under model fit. It's called model comparisons. Click on that. And you have some new output. That is not what I was expecting. Oh, I clicked on execution time. Okay, model comparisons. <laughs> new output. This output, let me zoom out for a sec. Here it is. Okay, this output uh, assumes the unconstrained model to be correct, assumes the measurement weights to be correct, assumes the structural covariances to be correct. Uh, let's look at metric invariance first. Um, which is the measurement weights, this model, compared to the unconstrained model. Let me zoom in. So when we compare the measurement model to the unconstrained model, um, the p-value for the chi-square is non-significant, meaning the chi-square produced by comparing constrained <laughs> regression weights to unconstrained regression weights across these two groups is no different from zero. So these are the same. So we meet the, the test for metric invariance. Next is to look at the structural covariances, which is actually worked out. Cool, I wasn't expecting that. Um, we want the, when we constrain structural covariances and unconstrain them and compare them, we want the chi-square to be non-significant. This means we have scalar invariance. I didn't include the intercepts here, whoops. We need to include the intercepts. Because scalar invariance includes both covariances and intercepts. So to do that, what you have to do is go to your analysis properties and uncheck modification indices and go to the estimation and make sure you check this box right here. Estimate means and intercepts. If we don't estimate means and intercepts, intercepts aren't estimated. And so we can't constrain them um, and, and unconstrain them for these comparisons. So estimate means intercepts, zoom out, close this, run again. Actually, we might have to uh, recreate the model, actually. Not the whole model, recreate the model, the multi-group uh, assessment. Yeah, it didn't produce it. So what you have to do is uh, once you've estimated means intercepts, and make sure it's still checked good, uh, go back to the model, uh, the multiple group analysis, Click on that, it's gonna say, I'm gonna wipe everything. Yep, that's fine, hit okay. And now it's gonna produce five models, I believe. Yep, five models, there we go. Hit okay. It now is going to constrain the intercepts as well. Yeah. What happens if all the models run fine except you're unconstrained? Have you seen that before? Unconstrained was non-significant? No, they oh, just significant? It wouldn't run. Oh, it wouldn't, wouldn't run? Yeah, yeah, it was dead, but that didn't. Do you have covariate errors? Because oh, that would do it. That might throw it off. Um, do you have the, the common latent factor mixed in there somewhere? No? 
Hmm. If you have a really small sample size in one group. Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, that's bizarre. The unconstrained model, try running it without the multiple groups assessment. Okay. Um, and it should, because it's the same model uh, as, as the, these. Okay, if we run this, there are now uh, usually measurement inter intercepts are listed here. We can look at those. So hypothetically, yeah. if you did not remove the constrained regression weight to the factors and you ran this, would you be 90% correct? So yeah, if, if you left the regression weight constraint on one of these indicators, uh, the only issue is you can't compare that path across groups. So if you're still good, if your p-values end up more than 0.05, who cares, you made it, you're good. Yeah. But if they didn't, then you might wanna try moving it and, and doing it again. Um, here's the output, and we see some differences now. Um, measurement weights, were still good. Metric invariance, score, we've got it. The p-value is the same as it was before. But the intercepts, no good. And covariances actually includes intercepts with it. Um, no good. So what do we do? We answer the chat. Let's see. What does the zero next to the one on the factor mean? Uh, that means you're estimating means and intercepts. The mean is zero. That's what it means. Because it's being estimated as zero. Okay. So we have a problem. Our intercepts are not invariant. Um, so we have some options. First option, social desirability, the marker variable, we don't care if it's invariant across groups because it's not part of our causal theory, right? It's just a control variable. Um, it doesn't need to, it, we're not testing any hypotheses with it. So for this particular test, we can unconstrain those constraints. So let's do that real quick. Um, you'll notice here that social desirability, um, the intercept is I-35 onward. So I'm going to zoom out here, go into my model. Here's uh, covariances model. I'm going to, or intercepts model, sorry. Double click the intercepts model. And it brings up the manage models dialog. I'm going to scroll all the way down to I-35 and get rid of everything from I-35 onward. Deleted. I'm going to do the same in my structural covariances model. Uh, I-35 to the end of the I's I'm going to get rid of. Don't get rid of those C's though. Okay, so those I-35 onward. You got rid of? I got rid of the constraints um, between On both, the both the social desirability. So we're not including them in this analysis. So I'm gonna close that, I'm gonna run it again, see if that just fixed it. So hypothetically, yeah. if you left the path constrained and you found you have scalar invariance that is not social desirability, mm. and you have isolated that particular factor, yeah. and then you're going to the path, do you then Remove that constraint from the path mm. and put it on the factor so that we can see whether or not that path has also scaled. Uh, if you didn't meet it for that, right? Then yes, I would un un unconstrain that path. Yeah. Okay. So you did that. You did the second part with structural covariances, and you actually deleted it as well. Yeah, I did in both. And notice things did change. Um, the p values are getting higher, yeah. but they're not fixed. There's more we need to do. So, next is to go see where are the differences. Right now, we clearly do not have uh, scalar invariance. Um, and so, what we need to do is find out if we have partial scalar invariance. And to do that, we're going to go to the estimates here and scalars and intercepts. Here they are. Estimates, scalars, intercepts. And what we want to do is we want to find out where are the big differences between our two groups because that's what's causing this invariance is the different intercepts. 
because um, it's forcing them to be equal and the extent to which they're different is inflating the chi-square. Okay, so for the intercepts, I'm gonna click here, copy, take it over to Excel. And just paste it in here. This is for the male group. I'm gonna do the same for the female group. To switch to female, just down on the bottom left, you click on the female label and then copy this over, paste it in here. And I wanna see what is the difference. So give me a delta equals absolute of the estimate minus the estimate. I'll zoom in, sorry. Uh, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo, ah. So it's just the absolute value of the difference between the two estimates. Because I wanna see which ones have the biggest difference. So I can unconstrain those and see if I have at least partial scalar invari invariance, where most of, thing, most of the things are invariant, but maybe there are a couple that aren't. So I'm gonna fill that down. And How did you fill that down? oh, I double clicked the little handle here. Um, there is this itty bitty little handle, this little like square. If you double click that little square, it fills down. Yeah. Um, okay, we wanna find the big ones. So just to make my life easy, I'll do conditional formatting. Top, bottom, give me the top 10 items. Uh, yeah, top 10 items. Here they are. Looks like it's anxiety. Our two groups, males and females, believe it or not, treat anxiety differently. Yeah, and I'm totally over it. Um, so, turns out we treat it differently. Same with social desirability, but honestly, we don't care about those. We've already unconstrained those. Um, so it's mainly anxiety, and then there are these two others, playfulness, five and six. Anxiety and playfulness. And for anxiety, oh, we less. Look at this. There's one anxiety, seven, that is probably okay. We're going to leave that one constrained. But the rest, we're going to unconstrain. So at least we'll have partial uh, invariance, hopefully. So anxiety, one through seven. We can see right here that those are I7 through 12. So we're going to remove I7 through 12 in our model. But could you technically stop there and say, because you have one invariant? Oh, but this isn't the test. So this test doesn't say, oh, this one's not invariant. I just said, give me the top 10 oh, I big see. ones. Okay. Yeah. So I7 through 12. In measurement intercepts, go find I7 through 12. I7 through 12, deleted. And make sure you do the same in the structural covariances. I7 through 12. You may think to yourself, how on earth am I ever going to remember all this? You would be right. <laughs> That's why we make videos, so you don't have to. All right, and then the other one was uh, I-18 and I-19. <coughs> okay, I-18, uh, and I bet this will do it. And in the other model here, structural covariances, I'm so excited to run this. I'm gonna save this as the new model, run it, hope a little. Please. Look at the output, model comparison. Oh, ho, ho, look at that. We did it. Yeah, right on the border. <laughs> Our intercepts. Right on the border, our invariance, our covariances, no problem. We have partial scalar invariance. That's what we report. And what do we say? We say we have partial scalar invariance. All factors were invariant except um, anxiety, which was partially invariant, and playfulness, I guess. Playfulness. So scalar, or I can't say right. scalar. Scalar. Scalar invariance is talking about each of the factors separately. Um. Ideally, we, well, so this one, it's looking at the model as a whole. Okay. But we looked at it individually and said, well, but actually, it was just anxiety. Okay. 
and a little bit of playfulness. So we report both. We say globally, uh, we have partial invariance. But if you were to look at each factor individually, we have full invariance, except for anxiety and playfulness. So anxiety, the female answered the question differently than the, than the male. At least there's a different distribution, is what we observed. So it's, it's mean and variance is different. Uh, correct. And so what, what we interpret from that is that uh, when we are asking about anxiety, let's say we have a hypothesis in our causal model that says anxiety leads to uh, less enjoyment of using Excel, right? Uh, the issue we run into is anxiety is apples for men and oranges for females, for women. So it, we can't say that anxiety le leads to something because it's not anxiety, it's anxiety male and it's anxiety female. It's two separate things. I understand that apples are not oranges. Yes. But I have a harder time following why anxiety, why there's two kinds of anxiety. It's the way we interpreted it. The two groups interpreted the questions differently. So is that do females experience different anxiety or? I think there are books about that. Interpret the um, question differently. I, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I know I'm on, I'm on record here. If I ever if I ever run for office, all of these videos are going to be scrutinized <laughs> or deleted. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Um, so which is why I'll never run for office. Um, but I, I don't know, but this might help. So yeah. Let me see if I need please, please. But sometimes in cross cultural studies, mm. when we run certain constructs, we understand differently. So, for example, pride. Mm -hmm. Spanish speakers, pride is never, ever, ever positive. Pride is something that is negative. Mm. Whereas for English speakers, many times they use pride. I'm so proud of my child. As a, as a positive way. Yeah. So if you would run, you know, even with translation, you know, pride or the Uyghur, if you would run it with English speakers and uh, uh, Spanish speakers, they both read pride, they both understand pride, but they interpret pride differently. You are exactly correct. This is exactly what I'm trying to say. Remote folks, did that? Did you did you hear any of that? Can he repeat the question, please? Oh, yeah. So apparently not. Um, so the issue of invariance. Uh, this is a great example. I'm just going to repeat it. Um, in different cultures, uh, such as in in Spanish, Spanish speaking, um, the word pride, the construct of pride. Is always a negative connotation. Whereas in English speaking, like in America, we're always talking about how much pride we have in our team and in our children and our whatever. Um, and it's a very positive thing. Um, and so if you would ask the same question on a survey to Spanish, Spanish speaking and English speaking, you're asking about two separate constructs. It's not the same construct. That's what we see with anxiety here. Men and women interpret anxiety differently. So that's also like what you're uh, some, what bias? Like a yeah, there's a cultural bias. Um, in this case, there's a gender bias. Yeah. So that's why we have to test for invariance. Because if let's say we ignored invariance, because it's just such a pain in the rear, right? And we went straight to our causal model and we tested our hypothesis that anxiety leads to uh, better decisions or worse decisions or something in Excel. Um, and we come out with nothing, or we come out that there is a positive effect. We actually couldn't have confidence in those results because anxiety isn't just anxiety, it's two separate things for men and for women. So that's why we have to test it. But now we can be confident. We at least have partial invariance. Is it also possible that they're not just interpreting it differently, but they were reacting differently? Yes, the whole, the whole recording of the data for that group was different for, than for this group. Okay. Like the measures we got for them. Okay, so that would be you wanted to know the difference between those two tests or different. Oh yeah, we could actually go into an interesting study. Well, let me try something real quick. Just thanks for amusing me um, or humoring me. That humoring me. That amused, you also amuse me. But uh, <laughs> um, let's go to SPSS real quick and um, run a one-way ANOVA on just anxiety. And instead of group num, let's use gender. 
Uh, would, would you go gender? You are. We have a Levine's homogeneity variance test running right now. Is it going to be significantly different or the same? It's going to be some different, some the same. Overall, it says different, 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 and look at that, number seven, the one we saw was okay, is the same. I don't know if you can see these, sorry, this is small. But the p-values for all of the differences between men and women, different, except for number seven, where it is the same. So we have partial invariance for anxiety. Interesting. Okay. Invariance is an advanced topic. Um, and often you don't report that you did an invariance test. You just assume that those who did the analysis were doing it. Sorry, I've been ignoring these. Uh, let's see. So is it insignificant, non-significant at 0.05 or greater or just greater than 0.05? Because if it's greater than 0.05, then it is significant at uh, level, nope. Is it the same construct of, that's, oh. Sorry, Rob. Um, is it the same construct? Are the two cultures treating it, or is it, or are the two cultures treating it differently? It's a different construct. I mean, it's the same construct overall. It's we labeled it the same, but it's treated differently. <laughs> so I just said yes to both sides of your question. Uh, no, they statistically it's different. I'm gonna say that. Did you say yesterday that a construct can be considered invariant if one of the regression lines on the factor is invariant? Correct, we have partial invariance if one is correct. How come my questions don't sound as good when you read them <laughs> as they do when I write them? Don't answer that. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. We appreciate your contribution to the levity of this conference. All right. Um, Sorry, James? Yes. <laughs> yes. From yeah. models, yeah, for model stability, isn't there a minimum required sample size for each group? Yes, there is a minimum sample size. So this is an issue. If we are running an invariance test on a small group, there will be a lot of error. And so naturally, the chi-square will be inflated. Um, and so the invariance test might be confounded by that small sample size. Um, the larger the sample sizes, also the chi-square can inflate, but we have less error. So, is there a sweet spot? Probably. I don't know what that number is. But is that what you're asking? Sorry. Yes. Um, I wondered if the sample size for females was adequate. That's all. Right. It is smaller. So, how many items do we have here? Uh, Should it be at least 30? Or sorry, what? Should it be at least 30? Oh, so there's a... Yeah, uh, it was a Fisher said, you need at least 30 to run an ANOVA or a t-test. Uh, for SEM, it's way more. Um, it, depends, it depends on the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, but one way to calculate it is 50 plus five times the number of observed variables. Yeah. But we have a lot of observed variables here. We have what? 7, 14, 21, 20, 30, 30 40, 40, 50 variables here, um, 47 variables. So um, that's a lot. We need 300. We have 300, but not in the female group or in the male group. So we're limited. Yeah. We don't have to do this if it would take too much time, but uh, I missed that. Scalar invariance? Dang straight. If it's going to take too much time, just skip it. No, we just. Oh, that, that's not what you're saying. transferred over to Excel. Can, can, can you run that mechanic one more time? Oh, we that's important. Time. Yeah. So if you can't find it, the invariance at one level, what you're going to do, if it's at the metric level with measurement weights, you're going to transfer over the regression weights, the unstandardized regression weights. If it's with uh, intercepts, you're going to transfer over the intercepts, and I'll show you how to do that. If it's with the covariances, you transfer the covariances. Let's. Do, which one would you like to do? Uh, which one would you do? What, what do we do the first time? Intercepts, the first time. Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to okay. see it run one more time. So if you go to the output um, and you go to the estimates and scalars, there is a section for intercepts, yeah. and so you just left click over here in the white space, then right click and copy, and push this over to Excel. Um, just create a new sheet here, paste that in, and then go back, and you have to switch down on the bottom left, you have to switch it to the other group, and then copy this over, 
and paste it in here. And then you're going to create a delta between the two, which is just the absolute difference, um, A equals ABS, between estimate one minus estimate two, and then drag that down. And for me, I did a conditional formatting here, just to highlight the top 10 items. And since it's absolute difference, they're all positive, um, or absolute value, excuse me. Uh, anyway, and that highlighted the big items. And then I went and removed. Do you want to see that part? No, I'm there. Okay, yeah. So just remove those from the constraints. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have an invariance plugin. I shouldn't have named it invariance. Sorry. It's actually a multi-group comparisons plugin, so it doesn't apply to a CFA. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But we achieved at this point, we achieved partial scalar invariance, full metric invariance, and full configurable invariance. So we'd report that just like that. We ran variance tests, configurable metric and scalar, and we found full invariance for the first two and, and then partial for the last one due to anxiety and playfulness being interpreted slightly different between men and women. And that's it. I wouldn't spend paragraphs on this. It should be a couple lines. Okay. I think I need some more gummy bears. My heart keeps skipping. Um, at least that's my excuse. I'm going to switch over here real quick. Okay. Thanks. Hold on. Here. Yeah. <laughs> I pretend that sugar helps, but medically speaking, it actually doesn't at all. Um, but it gets me excited. So maybe the adrenaline helps. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've done this. Next, run a full validity test. Yep. Honestly, I would actually go in a different order. I wouldn't do that yet. You guys are watching me edit this thing. I'm going to change this. Are we out of order? Yeah. This one, I'm going to switch. There we go. Because things might change during the method bias test. So you might as well wait. Save. Here we go. Response bias. Cool. This is, believe it or not, the most painful part of the CFA. We didn't just finish the most painful part. <coughs> We're yet to do it. Okay, method bias. Um, we should talk about this briefly. Method bias is the assumption that the way you collected is, is, is the assumption that you didn't get exactly what you were expecting to get. Your, the responses to your questions on your survey were somehow biased by some, um, some other factor, some compound. Uh, this could be, in our case, social desirability. Um, it could be, in other cases, uh, loyalty to a company, or confidence, optimism, things like this. The, a third, in, uh, they call it endogeneity, a third confounding factor that just raises everything or dampens everything. Um, a good example of this is uh, I did a study in Nigeria where we were studying corruption in business. And we were asking businessmen the extent to which they lie, cheat, steal, bribe, um, and engage in corrupt practices. Believe it or not, there's a social <coughs> way to answer those questions. Um, of course, I do not lie, I do not cheat, I do not steal. Bribing, on the other hand. Uh, no, but um, so we had to collect with that data, we had to collect social desirability bias uh, questions to see to what extent they inflate all of their responses based on the socially desirable way to answer a question. And then because we collected social desirability, we were able to then, what's the word, account for it. We were able to uh, adjust, that's what I was looking for, adjust 
their scores based on the social desirability inflation. And that's what we've done here. Um, do we think that there is a socially desirable way to answer questions about usefulness and anxiety and playfulness? Maybe. Anxiety, probably there's some negative connotations in anxiety. Uh, decision quality, definitely. People are always going to say, I make better decisions than worse decisions, right? Uh, who makes worse decisions? So there is some social desirable way to answer these. It's probably not the best marker variable for this data set. Uh, maybe a better marker variable would be something like computer self-efficacy uh, or optimism or self, what's the word, like ego, um, something like that, self-appraisal. Okay, so we need to control for that is what I'm trying to say. If you don't control for method bias, then you could end up with a lot of uh, positive relationships between variables that aren't real. They're false positives because the positive relationship is actually due to shared bias variance, not shared trait variance. So we need to fix that. To do that, um, I'm going to save this, but I'm going to go back to my CFA initial 2018 model my ungrouped model. <coughs> and then we have plugins for this. Hmm. Dang it. If you don't have a plugin for this, it gets really painful. Uh, I'll show you real quick manually, but not the whole thing because it, it would just take too long. Hey, hey, James. Yeah. Sorry, I have one other dog. When we're going to vary that to scalar, should we move the factor, should we move the loading? constraint back over to an item rather than to the factor? The answer is you don't want to know, but you want to know. Um, I have a slide on this and it says exactly what to do, but it's only if you get really nitpicky. The way we ran it will work and is sufficient, but if you want to know like the, the true, true, true method, here's the slide on it. I'll show you. Uh, can we please do the uh, method bias on the group? Uh, sorry, what was that? Uh, what I'm saying now is uh, you said uh, now at this moment we have to do the method bias on the ungroup uh, model. So can we... Yeah, ungrouped model. Equally Correct. do the same thing on, uh, I mean, do the method bias on on the group model? Can we do that or it has some... No, I would strongly recommend you do it on the ungrouped model. Okay. okay. Yeah. Especially since we have a lower sample size for the female group. Okay. To answer your question, Dan. Here's the bullet point you need. Um, when you're doing scalar invariance, it is best to keep the constraints the same except for each factor for one of the groups, make the, uh, make the variance constraint equal to one and put the path constraint on the other group. So for male group, have it be a variance constraint. For female group, have it be a path constraint. Like I said, it runs just fine the way we did it. But this is the true, like the true approach. And it's also fine when you're randomly for both groups on the path constraint. Also fine if you, yeah, if you ran it for both groups with a path constraint. Yes. Okay. Um, so now we're, we're sort of going back to that CFA that we love. Yes. Um, and we're going we're gonna to do the bias testing. And uh, um, so hypothetically, is it better to do bias testing with your constraint on the factor, or is it better to do your bias testing with constraint on one of your intercepts? It is better to do bias testing with your constraint on the factor. Also, what if we had changed our CFA during the invariance tests? Let's say we had deleted, what was it, uh, decision quality seven. Um, now when we go back to this initial CFA, we should probably delete decision quality seven moving forward because we realized we, we aren't invariant without doing that. So we didn't in our model, but if we had deleted an item during the invariance test, we'd have to delete it now in our sort of our running uh, master uh, measurement model. Okay. I'm sorry, can you yeah. That? If we deleted an item during our invariance tests, um, then when we go back now and test for method bias, we'd want to test for method bias without that variable in there. So without our, our, variant yeah, without that variant variable, yeah, the non-invariant, <laughs> non <-invariant. laughs> exactly, the non that triple negative. Um, yeah, so our, we'd just be adjusting our master CFA 
to match our most recent uh, edits. So we should go back and eliminate our non-invariant variables? Only if you couldn't reach invariance, uh, partial invariance. If you had to delete a variable during the invariance test, leave it deleted the rest of the time. If you didn't delete any variables, don't delete any now. Yeah. And you technically have, just You're good. you technically have invariance, or as long as you have partial invariance. Yes, we have invariance, even if it's just partial. Okay, model bias. We have 20 minutes, let's see what we can do. Um, but I think we'll be, we're doing great on time. We still have three hours this afternoon and I've covered 80% of the material. So we're doing great. Um, this afternoon, we may run through Marie's model in a CFA, which would be so cool. Um, and then we may even jump into causal models so that we can spend more time tomorrow doing PLS and maybe finish by lunch tomorrow. Who knows? Get out early. Go for a hike. Um, here we go. Plugins. No, not plugins. To do it manually. Woo. To do it manually, you're going to move the whole model for a moment. I'm going to select all with a big open hand, use the fire truck but don't have the balloons selected. Then I'm gonna move the whole model over to the right, just so it's out of the way a bit. And then I'm gonna deselect with the closed hand. And then I'm going to add a common latent factor. I'm gonna use this ellipse tool and click and drag. Just make a nice big common latent factor here. Its size actually doesn't matter, but it helps when you're drawing things. Um, I'm gonna just move it a little bit. Okay, this is our common latent factor. I'm going to name it CLF. And in order to test the extent to which all variables were inflated by some external cause, what you have to do is relate some common cause to every single observed item, one at a time. You can see why we made a plugin for this. Because that's not all, folks. You also have to then run it unconstrained, and then constrained, and then constrained to equal zero. So there's a tool for this. Um, if you run, if you create this common latent factor like this, and then uh, select it, just like that, nothing else. And then run the common latent, nope, 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 not that one. Specific bias test, yeah. Run the specific bias test. What it's gonna do is it's, it's gonna connect all those for you. And then it's gonna run several tests in a row. And um, so you just gotta keep clicking proceed because it's going to run, oh, whoops, I need to name that variable. Ah, it's going to throw errors. Sorry. I'm going to, I was supposed to name it. My bad. Even I don't know how to use my plugins. So double click this, call it the CLF, CLF, or call it Bob, whatever you want. Um, and then select it. So it is blue and then run the plugin, specific bias test. Here we go, it's gonna run, proceed, and it's gonna run again. So that ran the unconstrained model. Now it's constraining all paths to be equal to zero. And then it runs all paths constrained to be equal to each other. It's thinking one more time. Now they're all equal to each other. And what it's doing is it's comparing these model doing chi models doing chi-square difference tests and to see is, is there um, bias, and if there is, is it evenly distributed? And here's what it comes out with. It says, chi-square difference test was significant. The unconstrained model versus a model where we assume there is zero bias. That's what that means, a zero constrained model. Uh, this says, no bias at all. Is there a difference between a model where we assume no bias and where we let bias sort of inflate itself? And the answer is, yeah, there's a difference. There is bias. You have method bias. And then equal constraints says, well, is that bias evenly distributed across the items or is it unevenly distributed? 
And in this case, it is unevenly distributed. The bias or the test is significant. And so here you go. The chi-square test for the zero constraint model was significant. There was measurable uh, bias. Therefore, bias, dis uh, bias distribution test was made of equal constraints. The chi-square test is significant on this test as well. Unevenly distributed bias. You should retain the, social, the specific bias construct, that's social desirability, for subsequent causal analyses. And then make note of this. So we, we failed the test. We do have method bias, but that's fine. What this means is we need to go back to our model and um, proceed. I should have left those connected. Dang. Um, when, we, when we proceed, let me go back to this. Uh, when we proceed to our causal model, we need to account for this bias. That's what this means. And so I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Um, after I answer this chat. When I run specific bias test plugin, I get the error message, please only select the specific bias latent factor. But I haven't selected anything. Can you run through that part again? Um, yeah, so uh, let's run this again. I'm gonna select all, move it over. Deselect all with the closed hand, that's important. <clears throat> Create a common latent factor, name it CLF, or Bob, I'm gonna do Bob, there we go. Name it Bob, and then you have to single finger point, select Bob or the CLF. Nothing else should be blue, only Bob should be blue. And then you can run a specific bias test. Proceed. So hopefully that'll help you. Um, okay, so moving forward, we need to account for this bias um, and by, by Calculating factor scores like we did in the EFA, by calculating factor scores in the CFA, while this is connected to everything, we are essentially parceling out all of the shared variance that's due to this compound. But we need to also make sure that isn't breaking our model. So let's check that real quick. I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna reconnect Bob to everything. Um, let me save and reopen uh, this one. There we go. Um, real quick, let me just connect Bob to everything. <clears throat> Plugins. Uh, there we go. Okay. Bob's connected, uh, or CLF is connected. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this just as a regular model um, and see if my validities and model fit are just destroyed. Model fit, it should actually be fine. But my validities, I want to see if like these loadings here are messed up. Lo and behold, they are. Look at this. Um, ah, stop. You can see negative loadings here, negative loadings here. The CLF broke my model. Well, dang. This is not uncommon when you add a common latent factor. And <coughs> the trouble is when you don't go back and check this and you proceed, you have a broken model. So any causal analyses you make after this are completely flawed. Um, so you got to go back and check and make sure your model is not totally broken. Now we can take two approaches to trying to fix this. Let's take the first simpler approach, which would be to look and see if we can tell what it is that's actually being broken. If we go to the estimates and we look at these p-values for all the non-CLF ones, huh? well, it looks like there's no problem. So uh, you look at the p-values, and usually when you have a broken model, some of the p-values become non-significant uh, for the, from the latent factor to its indicators. And so that's a good sign of where the breakage is happening. And so what you can do is move around constraints, uh, play around with it a little bit. Um, in our case, they're all still significant. They're just mostly negative. Look, there is a pattern, though. Ooh, anyone see the pattern? Social there are two positive ones, social desirability and anxiety. Stupid anxiety. Um, dang. I bet if we, not that we want to, but I bet if we removed anxiety, this would totally work. I just, for kicks and giggles, can I try it? Let me, let me just, uh, let me, I'm gonna save this as, I'll save as. 
uh, CFA uh, CMB 2018 with anxiety. And now let me do another one. Save as without anxiety. Now I'm going to delete anxiety. Oops. Almost there. Okay, let's run this again and see if it works. Proceed. And nope, even worse. Cool. All right, so that didn't fix it. So we're going to try the other approach. Um, I'm going to go back to this uh, with anxiety. Let me answer this text here. Let's see, if CMB breaks the model, are you more likely to remove an offending factor such as hypothetical anxiety if the factor is either a controller or moderator? The answer is no, I was just doing that for fun. Um, I wouldn't remove a factor at all, that'd be silly. What I do is what I'm about to do, check this out. So when the CLF breaks your model, uh, here's what I strongly recommend. Um, if you have a social desirability or some sort of marker specific bias variable to fall back on, you're gonna do what I'm about to do. If you don't have any marker variable at all, um, then you report method bias was detected, but including any sort of unmeasured latent factor uh, made the model completely unstable. So it is a limitation of our study. And that's it, it's just a limitation. We have method bias, so sorry. Um, but if you have marker variable, do this. Delete the common latent factor and delete all the covariance, <laughs> bless you. Whoever sneezed, you're not muted. You're raising your hand though. I didn't know you could do that. That's kind of cool. Ted, do you have a question? No, no, that was earlier, thanks. Oh, cool, lower hand, interesting. <laughs> I'm learning stuff. I can't remember what you said. <laughs> Factor stays red. If it stays red and stays red forever, we gotta shut it down and boot it back up. Yeah, if a factor stays red and it won't get unread, um, just reopen the model. You don't have to close Amos. Just save and reopen the model. Okay. So what you do is you delete all the covariances um, with your marker variables or variable if you only have one. So I'm gonna delete all these covariances here, and we're gonna treat our specific bias variable as our um, common latent factor, like this. Uh, I do want to covary these two, actually. Okay, I'm gonna move these over here. Zoom out. You go over here. You go over here. And with the plugin, you can just select these two here and say specific bias test. Hmm. Do I have something else selected? Let me deselect everything real quick. Just select these two. Plugins, specific bias test. Why did you delete all those covariant errors? Why or how? how? With the X here, just manually one at a time. I'm going to delete this one too. It seems to be throwing it off. There we go. My X is not deleting things. Is there an easy answer to this? Is it red, the thing you're trying to delete? Maybe. If it's red, it's just inactive and it's not responding, and so you have to reopen the model. You can save it and reopen it. It won't stay red if you save it. Okay, so this just treats each of these two like specific, uh, like the marker, uh, like the latent factor, common latent factor. And so it's gonna test whether this specific bias, social desirability, has some shared variance with all of the items. Let's see if this works. Oh, hey, I like this one. This one says, since it's not breaking the model, this one says, no, uh, social desirability is not 
impacting your model. You're good to go. Um, you can move on to causal modeling, but let's see, make sure to retain specific bias uh, variable as a control variable. That's actually optional at this point, um, but we have it, so we might as well include it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna impute um, factor scores. Assuming this didn't break our model, let's look at it, up arrow. Aha, uh -huh, see, no broken. Uh, it's not broken. Nice. All these values look valid and strong. This is great. In fact, we could, uh, I wonder if our plugin here will work. Um, validity and reliability. Proceed. Here we go. Lots of uh, issues there, but uh, that's because they're not correlated with anything. But look, our validities are still good with the specific bias uh, markers in there. Which ones would I report? I would report this as my final correlation matrix, ignoring social desirability here. But this is my final set of measures here. Um, and I have no validity concerns because uh, social desirability is not one of my factors of interest, it's now just a marker variable. Um, and this is the validity I, I report. And then, we have three minutes. And then, from here, this is the next step. You just go save, but then you uh, do um, data imputation right here. Analyze data imputation. This will create factor scores for you adjusted for any potential bias observed, uh, being parceled out by social desirability. And if we do that, we don't even have to include social desirability as a control variable because it's already accounted for. Nice. Accounted for in social it's, accounted for, it's accounted for in all the measures because right here, what we're doing, we're parceling out all, um, we're parceling out all of the social desirability shared bias from all items. And so when we impute factor scores, the extent to which social desirability was impacting all variables is already being adjusted for in the new factor score. Trust me on that one. Just trust me. All right, there's a text here. Um, but could there be other biases not related to social desirability? Dang straight, yeah, there could. Uh, like uh, optimism and ego and uh, vengeance, that could be impacting the model, um, but is not detected with our successful test. But in your model, SD is also a control variable. Uh, I was controlling for it because I thought it might be an issue. Um, and if I were to just have these co-varied with all other factors, then I would still have to control for social desirability in my causal model. But since I'm using it as a specific bias marker variable here, um, I do. I no longer need to control for it in my causal model because I'm already controlling for it in all the measures. If that makes sense. James. Yeah. What if on the specific bias test your unconstrained and your zero constrained model are identical? Is that that just means? It's that means well, that that would mean that there is no difference. It's unlikely, but there is no difference. Yeah. Okay. So that's our model, that's our final CFA model. The next step we'll do after lunch, but essentially you just impute factor scores and then you have a new set of variables you can use to uh, run your causal analysis. So we're imputing after lunch? Yep, or we're gonna impute now. <laughs> it takes a few seconds. Data impution, right here. Proceed. Can we impute after lunch? All right, I'm imputing now, but we can impute after lunch as well. Okay. I'm just gonna hit impute. And it imputed, woo! What this did is it created a new data set for me. Right here, data, here it is. This is my new data set. And it has new factor scores, each or new variables, each called the same as the latent factor. Yes. And they're down here. Variable view at the very bottom. And here they are, my new factors. I can use these just like I use factor scores from EFA. We'll get to that after lunch.
two hour lunch. Um, I'm gonna go to the Canton Center again because um, it's so good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to put your stuff in my office, I'll go to my office first. Um, let's see. And stop this. Stop share. And 